Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? I'm Candace Kelly sitting in for Roland. Here's what's coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump and the family of Ronald Green are calling for federal civil rights charges against law enforcement officers who beat the black motorist to death, then tried to cover it up. Attorney Crump is here to explain why Green's family is demanding that the Department of Justice step in. FedEx fires the black Mississippi FedEx driver that two white men shot at while he was delivering packages. This is yet another blow, as a judge declared a mistrial for the driver's shooters. And we'll tell you which two of the 19 indicted in Georgia for trying to overturn the election turned themselves in before Friday's deadline. In today's marketplace, we'll meet the man who is trying to ensure that the world has clean, safe drinking water. The founder of the Moses West Foundation will explain how he turns air into water. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. The family of Ronald Green, the black man killed by Louisiana State Police, there are calls for federal civil rights charges against the men who caused his death. Flanked by civil rights attorney Ben Crump, Green's family, still waiting for justice in his murder, said the Department of Justice should indict the man responsible for Green's death. In July, a judge ruled that two of the five indicted ex-state troopers, John Peters and Dakota DeMoss, will no longer face obstruction of justice charges. Now, several other felony charges still stand, including the most severe charge of negligent homicide against Master Trooper Corey York. Today, York's request to have his indictment dropped was heard. He claims his rights for self-incrimination were violated. The family believes the state needs to do more and wants the federal government to take over. Green died on May 19, 2019, after an encounter with the former Louisiana State Troopers following a high-speed chase in Union Parish. Police told his family he died because of a car crash during that chase. And since his death, Green's family has filed a wrongful death civil lawsuit against the Louisiana State Police. They're seeking payment for all of the medical and funeral expenses. Joining me now is civil rights attorney Ben Crump. Ben, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, and thank you for covering this important case. Absolutely. So I know that today at the press conference, we heard from a number of people what was key, obviously, to this press conference that is that you want the federal government to step in. What are some of the things that you would like to see happen because the federal government steps in? They certainly have more powers to do what they need to do uh, to bring justice to this. Yeah, uh, the federal government has a different standard that gives them more latitude than the state of Louisiana. And we have far more confidence in the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division than in the local Louisiana uh, officials, law enforcement officials, who work hand in hand with these troopers who brutally, brutally killed 
Ronald Gray. It is just as horrific of a killing by police as the officers in Memphis, Tennessee, who brutally killed Tyree Nichols. And so the only difference is that the five officers that killed Ronald Green in Louisiana were white police officers versus the officers who killed Tyree Nichols was black police officers. And, and therefore, we are arguing that we need the Department of Justice to come in just like they did with George Floyd, just like they did with Ahmaud Arbery, just like they did with Breonna Taylor. And we have to have them come in on Ronald Green because his killing was just as horrific as all the others. And, and one of the points that was certainly brought up at the press conference by his sister was that she was the one who got the first call. When she got that call, she was told a lie in terms of uh, how he died. She was told that he crashed through a window during the police chase. This turned out not to be the case. I want to talk a little bit about the specific charges that you would like to see um, uh, being leveled against the police officers. And really, what are the chances that you think uh, it will actually make a difference when it comes to police enforcement and the way that they need to make changes? Well, I believe just like with George Floyd, just like with Ahmaud Arbery, uh, who, where, who was killed by quasi-police officer, retired police officer, uh, Mac Michaels, that it sends a chilling effect once you have the federal government who has a lot more authority to come in and say, if you lied to us, that's a, a crime. If you were there and aided and abetted, well, that's a conspiracy. I mean, there's so many things that the federal government can do. They can look at it from a racial perspective. I mean, once the feds get involved, what is the percentage of 95 percent conviction rate versus the state of Louisiana, which, you know, is tragic. This is the very first time that they have ever indicted police officers for killing a black man in the state of Louisiana. And so that's why his mother, Mona, and his sisters, Danielle and Alana, are fighting so hard not to let their brother's death get whitewashed and swept under the rug in Union County, Louisiana. They're saying, no, we need the Department of Justice to come and do justice I mean, it's not a very difficult ask when you look at the video. Mm -hmm. As we said at the press conference, we don't need to say no more. Just look at the video. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got a police officer confessing. And you're talking about setting precedent, really, when we look at this being the first case, potentially, that the Department of Justice could take on and uh, uh, indict people on this level. What would you say are the next steps and how what are your feelings about the department of justice getting involved and uh, i guess the fact or the the idea that that will even it happen happen at all well i know uh, ronald green's family is coming to the march on washington uh which is going to be on saturday and then candace he's going to have a huge rally on the states of the courthouse stairs in baton rouge louisiana on the eve of his birthday on September 27th. And we know a lot of national uh, figures are coming into Louisiana. And we know that all the local activists are coming and demanding justice for Ronald Green. We have to say his name every time we say Tyree Nichols' name because his video was just as bad. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about what the family is actually demanding, what you're demanding as an attorney in this case, um, in terms of monetary damages, in terms of anything else that you would be asked of the court system in this case. Well, I, I'm working with a great team of lawyers. It's always a team effort. And just like we demanded $500 million in the killing of Tyree Nichols, in many ways, I think this is worse than Tyree Nichols. Uh, just as bad when you look at the facts that Ronald Green said, I was just scared. I, 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 I don't want to hurt nobody. He said, I'm your brother. And they still savagely beat him to death while he was in handcuffs, and they put him in shackles, and they punched him and kicked him. And then you can't forget that video where he said, he beat the living mm -hmm out of him. That's very analogous 
to uh, Tyree Nichols when the police officer in that case, I beat the H-E-W-L out of him. I was hitting him with haymakers and everything. And you got police officers not only killing a black man on video, but then you got them talking about it in their own voice. How can we be... I, I, what more of a smoking gun can we give you, America? Mm. You know, this is something, obviously, that has been your life's work. Uh, you have been on the ground on so many of these cases. We've talked about Cop City, for example, uh, the training facility in Atlanta. And I wanted your feelings about places like Cop City and places that call themselves training centers. And ultimately, what is the training that you think needs to change and happen uh, so that these types of things don't happen as much or at all? Well, I think we have to put people over politics and we have to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act because we have to have police officers have systematic implicit bias training, but then also when they uh, use excessive force and violate the constitutional rights of black and brown people disproportionately, we have to make sure that there's some federal guarantees that say, you will be put in jail for doing this. And that's what we are lacking right now. We have to make sure that we have, for the first time since Lyndon Bain Johnson's Great Society legislation in the 1960s, substantive police reform. We have not had it, and it's now by past time that we have it. How many more hashtags? Think about from Trayvon Martin to now with Tyree Nichols. How many hashtags have black people had to put on the board to show America that there are extrajudicial killings by police officers, and it's disproportionately unjustified when it comes to black and brown people? All right, well, uh, Ben Crump, I believe that you're staying with us after the break. I'm going to check in on that. But this is Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, and we will be right back after this break. Thank you. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Blood and soil. You will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Next on The Frequency with me, Dee Barnes, the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion and the subsequent trial of Tory Lane. Megan has been treated like the villain. The experience that Megan went through is something that all Black women face when we are affected by violence. This is something that's called massage noir. There's a long history of characterizing Black women as inherently bad in order to um, justify our place in the society. Next on The Frequency with me, D Barnes. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman. Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. Hey, it's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Thank you.
I want to bring in my panel to discuss the Ronald Green family's demand for the Department of Justice to step in and charge the men responsible for his death. I'm joined right now by Randy Bryant, DEI disruptor out of Washington, D.C. And also joining me is Drew, Dr. Drew Brown, professor of African-American studies, sociology and criminology and law from the University of Florida. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, Dr. Brown, I wanted to start with you. I mean, we have been here before. I wanted to know your take about the press, press conference and the fact that this would be the first time that this type of uh, a case would be brought through the Department of Justice in Louisiana. Certainly, we know that there have been other uh, events like this that, that have gone on in Louisiana. And I just wanted your thoughts on this case so far. Yes, thanks for having me. And it definitely should be brought to this level. I think we've seen too many of these incidents where something drastic has to be done. I think it's um, completely appropriate that civil rights charges be brought. I think we see very, very much similarities between um, as, as, as Brother Crump uh, alluded to, we see a lot of similarities between Ronald Green and Tyree Nichol. But also, when we talk about um, Ronald Green's case and the cover-up that happened, this reminds us of Michael Corey Jenkins and Eddie Terrell Parker in Mississippi, where they had a police cover-up as well um, that came to light. And so when we talk about um, legislation and we talk about things that uh, have, have, have been said and the rhetoric, even by um, President Biden, a lot of the legislation that he was sort of pushing was to ban certain moves, like the chokehold and other moves. And really, we need to demand legislative legislation, um, substantive legislation that provides transparency and accountability. And that I think will lead us um, to holding these police officers more accountable. And that's really what, you, what we're working towards. Randy, I want to go to you. It, it seems to me that, as I said, we've been here before, but a lot of the power that people hold falls within the community. The press conference today, they spoke for over 35 minutes about what they wanted and took people through the story of Ronald Green and his death. What are your thoughts about the, the fact that the people in the community and the people who are on the ground really in so many ways are the ones that have been keeping this particular case alive? And that's what, what is necessary in order for these cases to continue to survive. Yes, it's an absolute shame that we have to take justice into our own hands, but this is certainly not new for us, and I believe we're prepared uh, to do so. Um, I had the pleasure to be on this show a few, I guess, a few months back, and Ronald Green's mother was on the show, and I heard her determination, and I was very clear that she was not going to let this case rest until those murderers stood trial. Um, she was not, and, and she talked about how, you know, how the story has changed and evolved, and she had to learn about updates on the news. I mean, the cover-up has been as bad as the crime. And so it's unfortunate that we're here, but I'm happy that we have someone like Mrs. Green pushing the efforts, because I have no doubt that she will see this to the end. I felt her determination when we uh, talked with her. The, to think that this happened back in 2019, and here we are in 2023, and still chasing for some sort of real accountability, some sort of real justice, is sad. But clearly, um, they need some oversight. And Randy, I want... I want to stick with you for a moment and that, as you said, this is 2019. It took two years for the video to actually even come out, which, again, speaks to this idea that there are people who are on the ground that have to be driving the front seat, in the front seat, to make sure that evidence comes into fruition, uh, that information uh, is brought to the attention of the public, and that something like this is kept alive. Well, what are your hopes? Because we've been talking about training throughout the week and uh, Cop City. What, what are your hopes that, that will, in terms of what might change for training in terms of police officers that are out in the street serving community today? Yeah, you know, I've done this work for a long time, and of course, I do believe training is important. Um, one, it needs to be much more intensive. It needs to be continuous. 
They need to be reminded of lessons because we have to realize that these are people, all of us, have been raised in a society that was divided and based on white supremacy and racism. And so those lessons don't just go away because someone like me comes and does a three-week course for, you know, three hours that week, a week. Um, so it needs to be where they're constantly being reminded of what's acceptable and unacceptable, but no amount of training will work if there are not consequences. Um, I could, you know, train people on how to drive and tell you what the speed limit is, but I promise you that people will speed if they did not get tickets, right? Mm -hmm. We know how to do the things right, but there needs to be some accountability. It needs to be where at least people don't feel as if they can continue in with their professions. They still sometimes, oftentimes, just get placed on office duty. They still get salaries. Um, and, and also, I don't want to see the states always paying for what these individual officers do, but the individual officers doing losing their pensions. Um, it has to hurt. You have to have consequences. That's the way we've done with every other thing from sports to corporate America. There must be consequences. Dr. Brown, when we talk about the federal government getting involved in cases like this across the country, it has been happening. It has been happening for years. Uh, what are your thoughts about whether or not it has been having any effect? It, the federal government seems to be kind of the, the last way for people, for the justice system to try to work. If it's not working legislatively, we can go to the federal government, go to the executive branch and make that happen. But do you have confidence and faith in the federal government getting involved in order to see any type of real change? Yeah, so it's, it's not a matter of do I have confidence or faith. We can just look at the facts. And the facts, the facts of the matter is that it is not progressing fast enough. Yes, there are some instances and some statistics will show that it is, uh, um, it is crawling to a, an improvement. However, it is not going fast enough. We're still seeing a large amount of these cases where we see uh, all white officers brutalizing black men and women. And it's really not even just all white officers. We've seen in other cases that it is a police culture that is producing these brut brutal assaults on black and brown folks, whether it be men or women. And I think that um, there are certain things that, that the government is trying to do, but obviously it's not enough. Um, the money that is costing cities because of these instances is ridiculous. That seems to not even be working, hmm. right? There needs to be more that, 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 that should be done, can be done, if we're going to cause a massive change in this. Uh, I am somewhat uh, skeptical whether these small sort of uh, changes that we are seeing is going to lead to an overall culture change in policing. I don't think that's going to happen. What needs to happen is very drastic changes in how we um, deal with police brutality. Randy, we talk about training, and, and uh, Dr. Brown talked about the disrupting, disrupting this culture of police officers that people say certainly is in place, and we've seen either white, white or black, it doesn't matter, the, the outcome is the same in terms of who the perpetrators might be in these types of cases. In your line of work, what would you say are some of the things that, that different places, police officers across the country need to learn and change about the culture how they are trained to make them better on the ground. What is the culture, do you suspect, that is causing these types of things to continue to happen? The culture is very much wrapped around bad guys and good guys. If we even look at what we see on television shows and movies, um, they think that the police officers think that they're the good guys. And certain people are the bad guys. And they're not seeing people as whole people, as, as individuals that may make a mistake or maybe just uh, looking in, you know, being at the wrong place or the wrong time. Um, they, they see people as criminals. And unfortunately, that is very much aligned with race. I mean, it has been shown study after study how people just see black people and feel a sense of fear. So, of course, you can justify shooting somebody if you say, I felt fearful. And and you can say that you were feeling fearful simply by a person, a black person existing, right? And so the training must include where we are um, putting people in situations, giving them scenarios where they are able to see us as whole human beings. Because quite frankly, I don't think that they do. They're seeing a stereotype in their minds. 
Um, you know, they, a lot of program, a lot of police programs, oftentimes now have police officers that are either from a neighborhood or where they have where they're spending more time within the neighborhoods, so they can get to know people and at least have experiences. You see, um, racist incidents decrease the more experience that people have with people that are different than them. So being uh, being put into places where you're dealing with difference and you're not just basing all of your decisions off of immediate reactions based on your racist biases would definitely help us see, I believe, some improvement in from what we're seeing today. And, you know, Randy, when I was speaking to, to Ben Crump about changes and, and uh, cop city and training facilities, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people have to understand, and my question to you is that it takes time, right? So that even if training is put into place, the effects that we're going to see are going to be perhaps longer term effects. In your estimation, how long does it take to possibly change or shift a culture inside of a police department? Ooh, I, I, it depends on if we go back to that accountability. I promise you people work much more quickly when it's something that affects their bottom line, when it's something that hurts them personally. Um, let, let them see a fellow police officer get into severe trouble for abusing his power. Um, and I promise you, and I'm talking about real trouble, where financially he is hurt, where he loses his job, where he is, you know, publicly shamed. I, though, that's when you see change. That's when we see real change. So again, that is why it is so important for the federal government to come in and say, even without us asking them to come, saying, you know, we are looking at what the rates are right now. We're not happy with what we see, just as we do with the USDA or anything else. There's got to be heavy accountability. And don't get me wrong, things are improving, um, especially under Biden, but it's certainly not where we need to be. It's going to have to be where there has to be personal accountability and personal consequences. I'm going to throw this over to Dr. Brown. You're, you're vigorously shaking your head. We want you to jump in here. Yes, because I think that when it talks about changing the culture and whatnot, ideally, we would want to see people's hearts and minds changed. But the fact of the matter is that that isn't going to happen for a lot of uh, police officers. That isn't going to happen in quick enough time. Um, but we can, as was said, um, have pers uh, uh, cause sort of personal accountability, making sure that we're hitting folks in their pension, making sure that there are consequences. You might not change your heart. You might not change your mind against how you view black people, but you are certainly going to change the way you uh, police based on you wanting to hold on to your money. You know, Dr. Brown, I, I, before we go to break, we've uh, talked about Mississippi and the officers that turned themselves in um, for, for beating two, two gentlemen. And I was wondering, what, what is your sense, just being a black man in the world, driving a car these days, has it changed a little bit, kind of your sense and sensibilities being behind the wheel, your firsthand experience, has it changed because you felt a, a little bit that there has been a change that you made reference to, that it might be a little bit better or none of that is something that we should be discussing at this point? Absolutely not. It, ha it hasn't changed. I think what has changed, though, is that we do see some support from black communities. We do see the Benjamin Crumps uh, coming to the aid of black people. We do see um, protesters and rallies and social media coming to the support of black people. But does that cause me to feel safe when I get pulled over by the police? Absolutely not. I really just feel like I, I have a stronger community behind me, but I'm still in danger. Yeah, you mentioned hashtags. Ben Crump mentioned hashtags and hoping that there, we do not have to have so many hashtags in order to make a point, uh, in order to save somebody's life. All right, Roland Martin Unfiltered. We'll be right back after this break. You're watching the Black Star Network. Stay with us. You go into a barber shop in a in a in a 700 credit score neighborhood, black or white. They're talking about their ideas and, and they're talking about how they're going to move on those things. You go to a barber shop in a 500 credit score, equal brilliance but bad culture. They're talking about other people. You go to a winner's winner's barber shop. Here's what I'm doing. You go to the barber shop of the where people feel defeated. They talk about other people, either celebrities or or. or or people they admire, but also often, I don't like Joe. I don't like, you know, I don't like Roland Martin. Well, let me tell you something. I don't understand people. Why, how could you not like 
anything here you see. You should just be like, this is amazing. It's cool. You may not even like how he does it or how I do it, but it's like, you know what? They're succeeding. They're killing it. All you should be is, that's fantastic. But if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about mm -hmm. me, it's hard for me to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's the big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life right. a living hell. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hey, what's up? Geek Theory in the place to be. Got kicked out your mama's university, creator and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, an air hip hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? The Mississippi Black FedEx delivery driver who says two white men shot and chased him has been fired. According to DeMontario Gibson's attorney, Carlos Moore, FedEx fired his client because he did not accept a part-time, non-courier job with the company offered in mid-July. Gibson provided RMU with a copy of the email informing Gibson of his termination. Your employment with FedEx was terminated effective July 26, 2023. Attempts have been made to deliver your letter and accompanying documents on July 31st, 2023, and delivery will be re-attempted today. In order to make sure you have received this communication, I have attached a copy to the mail. Please feel free to contact me with any questions you may have. Moore released this statement. FedEx has shown its true colors. It has never cared about my client's black life. How could any employer be so insensitive and tone deaf and fire a dedicated employee after he almost lost his life working for the company? I look forward to holding FedEx accountable in a court of law for intentional infliction of emotional distress for sending Mr. Gibson back to the same very dangerous route the very next day after the attack by the cases. It was Thursday that Judge David Strong declared a mistrial against the father and son, Brandon and Gregory Charles Case, because of errors by Brookhaven Police Department Detective Vincent Fernando, who admitted under oath that he did not give prosecutors or defense attorneys a videotaped statement police had taken from the victim. Now, um, the cases, they're charged with attempted first-degree murder, conspiracy, and shooting into Gibson's vehicle while he was simply making deliveries. Luckily, Gibson was not physically harmed in the incident. I'm drawn by my two panelists, but we have one more panelist, Jesse Hamilton McCoy, clinical professor of law, supervising attorney for the Duke Law Civil Justice Clinic. I tell you, this is something a lot of legalese, I want to kind of back into it because the mistrial was really important in this. And this doesn't mean that these defendants can't go to trial again. They probably will. But you have a mistrial, and it is an interruption of the process. Can you explain a little bit about what a mistrial actually means and the fact that this mistrial had everything to do with the fact that evidence, this time a videotape, was not turned over to all of the parties? And that was for uh, Jesse. Oh, I apologize. Oh, that's well, all right. Uh, Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So typically a mistrial occurs when there is some item of trial that did not uh, occur in an appropriate fashion. And in this case, it sounds like the prosecutor did not turn over uh, a piece of evidence that was previously demanded. Typically, with a mistrial, if prejudice is not attached, there'll be an opportunity to pursue once again. However, it, it does bode some concern uh, with the fact that the prosecutor didn't turn over uh, a, a document or an item that, that was requested. Um, this is Mississippi. This is a small town in Mississippi. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure 
uh, what the relationships there may be. But there are always things to consider and, and issues to be concerned about whenever you see situations where prosecutors aren't uh, fulfilling their due diligence. Right. And in this case, actually, it, it was the police, but really at the same time, you have attorneys that represent the police. And he took the stand, this officer, and said, I didn't turn over a videotape. You know, a lot of people are saying, how strategic, how timely that this happened at this particular time. And I'm wondering, have you been hearing the same, Jesse, in terms of, is this, was this something to really throw the case? Because it seems like something as simple as a videotape, which is very basic in terms of evidence that one needs to kind of hand over during discovery, um, it seems like something everybody would know about. C could this have been something a little more strategic and underhanded? Uh, it could be. I mean, there, there's no real way of knowing uh, kind of what the, the viewpoint is. I, I will say just usually because we are dealing with a small town in Mississippi, uh, I will always be concerned uh, <laughs> when the process doesn't work the way that it is designed to work. Uh, however, you know, the, the as long as prejudice is not attached, uh, there haven't been, there hasn't necessarily been evidence presented yet that will bar the inability for the prosecutor to bring the case once again. So, you know, all eyes are on this, Dr. Brown, especially because of the fact that here's a young man who was shot at. He took a non-courier position. They would not let him work from home. So then they fired him. Uh, certainly smells like a lawsuit to me. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Brown? Yeah, I definitely think that this is a, a miscarriage of justice, the way that the police just failed to turn over key evidence. Um, it is a small town, like was said. And so we can't help but think that there's there has to be some sort of alternative motive around why that evidence wasn't given, um, wasn't given up by the police. Uh, and then just the fact that when, um, when FedEx uh, fires um, um, Mr. Gibson, I, I truly do believe that all of, with the context of the case and all of that stuff and the reason why they fired him, um, I, I found it to be completely inappropriate. I think that I, I hope that in his civil suit towards FedEx, um, he ends up being uh, found awarded uh, a heavy sum. I think this is. Um, I think if 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 anything is going to be delivered, I hope justice gets delivered. Randy, it seems to me like FedEx they need to watch themselves because they fired someone who was fired at by a gun, did not allow him to work from home. This lawsuit, in terms of intentional affliction of emotional distress that is being threatened, it actually seems, I would imagine, that FedEx wouldn't be too surprised, but it is surprising that they would even go to this, through this process and not keep this young man employed, at the very least. Very bad PR decision. I'm assuming that someone at a lower rank based in that area of the country did make this decision and it was not, people didn't pay attention. Now that it is public, I promise you that at the, at the corporate offices and I believe in Tennessee are like, oh my goodness, because this is a PR nightmare, um, which I don't think any company would want this hanging over their heads. Um, what it says to me though, that is worthy of consideration it's what they expect of black people in this country. You know, you, you hear about hostile workplaces, and I've seen many people that are given, you know, leaves of absences for, you know, name calling or things like this. But a black man is expected to be shot at. And they didn't just shoot at him. I mean, they cornered him mm -hmm. where he could not move. They came out, They he parked his truck in a way that this gentleman could not move. They trapped him and then started shooting at him right? Which has got to be extraordinarily traumatic. But it's like Black people are not allowed to experience the full range of emotions. Not like that this gentleman is not allowed to be uh, fearful and have trauma and need therapy and need time off from work. He is expected, like many other Black people day after day, when we receive, you know, much less, but, you know, microaggressions, to go back to work and to smile and act as if we are over okay. And that is, that is not okay whatsoever. Yeah, Randy, it's interesting that you mentioned all those facts. And I will add to that, that he was in a UPS, a UPS uniform. I'm a FedEx uniform. Um, the, the, the car wasn't FedEx, but that prompted these two men to get out guns and go after them. And, you know, I'm just speaking to what you're saying about the, the, the fear that people have automatically of black 
men, black people often, when they are doing their job or having a picnic or just being whoever they are in whatever setting they are in. Right. And the, and the, and the, the van had FedEx on three sides of it. So it wasn't as if it was just a white anonymous van. It did say FedEx on the on three areas in the van, sides of the van. So they very much knew this was a FedEx dry, uh, delivery person and I believe went hunting literally for the fun of it from a place of anger and that they would get off by something that I believe is a, a purposeful cover up. I mean, this is what someone's job is to do, right? That this is the job is to hand over evidence. So I cannot believe that this case they forgot something so major, right? And but yeah, this FedEx, it is it I will tell you this, I don't know what's going to happen in the criminal case, mm -hmm. but I guarantee you FedEx is going to have to write Okay. It. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yes. absolutely. You know, I, I want to ask um, our professor of law here from Duke, Jesse, you give, you give this fact pattern to someone on in the, an exam. What is the outcome that you're expecting your students to write about that's going to be the right answer in terms of FedEx being responsible for intentional infliction of emotional distress here? Well, the true result from this most likely will be a, a confidential settlement uh, on the part of FedEx because they're going to try to avoid the PR nightmare. Um, it, it's blatantly obvious that this was a move that was very insensitive. Uh, on top of that, uh, if, if it's true what his attorney says, that they scheduled him for the exact same route in which his life was just put in jeopardy, that is the very definition of what intentional infliction of emotional <laughs> distress right. is. <laughs> um, so, so I would guess that somebody sitting on high at FedEx is going to uh, triage this, this situation uh, and provide a, a financial settlement that will be sufficient and ask for confidentiality uh, and, and, and signing the release. Yeah, I would say that they, they better be on their P's and Q's, uh, Dr. Brown. What is your take on all of this, especially the part, you know, that this is a young man who they just, they wouldn't give him his job back, not even at home, when most, when a lot of people are still at home post-COVID. He could have done something at home, is my guess. Yeah, this, I mean, this shows that when it comes to particularly black working class people, a lot of these companies feel like their lives are expendable. And I mean, if I was working for FedEx, I might even file my own suit. I'm, <laughs> I'm traumatized. <laughs> right, right. Let's go through this. And then you're going to then put me on that route? No. I think, um, <laughs> I think some other suits would come after that. And so um, I do think that, you know, I agree FedEx uh, was, FedEx misstepped to say the least in this. PR-wise, they're going to take a, a, a hit, a major hit. And so um, I really, I, I do, my, my, my heart and my concern really does go out for Mr. Gibson um, and the other FedEx workers and other um, mail carriers, for that matter. We've seen this happen a number of times where they're in a position where they're in someone's private property or on someone's private property just doing their job, and people are shooting at these people, cornering them, questioning them in an aggressive manner. And these are the people that are just doing their job. Jesse, I think that Dr. Brown brings up a very important point in that if I'm a FedEx worker and you're allowing this to happen to one of my coworkers, I'm feeling trauma traumatized. I'm feeling like I'm a part of that experience because I could be next. And if I am next, I will not have a secure feeling that FedEx, you are going to protect me or that you're going to protect my financial security, that you may ultimately fire me. And when we talk about that and we look at all of the people that could potentially really be a part of this case, it really is more than just about this one plaintiff. Certainly. Now, of course, you know, FedEx is going to have a voice in this, too. And they're going to say, well, it wasn't our intent to cause harm or intentional uh, inflation of emotional distress to everyone collectively. But some states do have an additional tort called negligent infliction of emotional distress. That's right. And perhaps that is the catch all where other people will be able to advance claims. Um, Renita, I'm sorry, Randy, I wanted to talk to you just about FedEx its responsibility. You talked about this is a terrible PR move. What would have been the right move on FedEx's part? One, keep him employed. Ask him how you could provide services. Say that, you know, you, you as a company care about your employees and you're going to provide 
therapy to this valued employee for however long he needs it. Send a, you know, you want to show that you care about your employees um, and ensure, and, and I mean, he had to be, have been covered through insurance. So to ensure he's getting the therapy he needs and he has the time to recover because a mental injury trauma is, 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 can be just as detrimental to someone as a physical injury. So they should have provided care for their employee without a doubt. And and what I would do as well, you everyone mentions a good point, and to send a message out to all of your employees on what you're going to do to ensure that they're as safe as possible. Because I would I would feel shaken as well, like, oh my goodness. Right. You know, I didn't know that I was putting my life at harm because I'm delivering somebody's um, you know. Uh, air fryer or whatever is being delivered. <laughs> and so absolutely, um, they need to ensure that they make their other employees feel safe right. on the job. And, and that is the takeaway. It seems to be a very strong case that this young man has against FedEx. And he's already in a case causing more an infliction of emotional distress on top of the, the, the case that was determined to be a, a mistrial. Companies do need to understand that what happens to one employee, you have to make other employees feel good about who they are in the workspace because it might be them next. All right, Roland Martin Unfiltered will be right back here on the Black Star Network. Stay with us. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, have you ever had that million dollar idea and wondered how you could make it a, a reality? On the next Get Wealthy, you're going to meet Liska Askelis, the inventress, someone who made her own idea a reality and now is showing others how they can do it too. Positive, focusing in on the thing that you want to do, writing it down and not speaking to naysayers or anybody about your product until you've taken some steps to at least execute. Liska Askelis on the next Get Wealthy right here only on Black Star Network. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Devon Frank. I'm Dr. Robin B., pharmacist and fitness coach, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, let's go to Georgia. Two of the 19 indicted in Georgia for trying to overturn the 2020 election have turned themselves in. According to Fulton County Jail's online database, Scott Hall was booked this morning. The Georgia Bell bondsman is charged with illegally seeking access to voting machines in Coffee County, Georgia, to search for evidence they were rigged. Now, John Eastman also turned himself in today. The former Trump advisor wrote a memo proposing how then-Vice President Mike Pence could challenge President Joe Biden's victory by rejecting key electoral college votes. Eastman says he's ready to defend himself on every count of the indictment. The team and I will vigorously contest every count of the indictment in which I have been named and also every count in which others are named, for which my knowledge of the relevant facts, law, and constitutional provisions may prove helpful. I am confident that when the law is faithfully applied in this proceeding, all of my co-defendants and I will be fully vindicated. 
All right, now all eyes are on Trump because Trump says he's going to turn himself in on Thursday. Trump and his cronies were indicted on 41 counts, including racketeering, violating the oath of office, and forgery. Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis is giving them until Friday to surrender to authorities. I want to, of course, bring my panel in on this. Randy, I want to talk to you first because, you know, he turned himself in a $100,000 bond. He is the mastermind, the engineer, and he is still saying that the election has been stolen. Your thoughts on that? How do I say this in a way that's appropriate? I mean, they're, they're nuts. <laughs> that's I, okay. I, I can't find the words. I, 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 they're nuts. And I, the, the thing is, I believe they believe the reality that they have been sold and wrapped up in their minds. I, be, I, I believe he believes that the election was stolen. I, I, you know, regardless of how much he sees to prove the opposite, they... You know, Trump, if he is nothing else, is a master manipulator. And you he has people who are very weak, who are, you know, the white fear that, you know, Roland wrote his book about and are clinging to this mastermind to save the world, to save the country as they want it to be. And I, I believe he believes himself. I, I don't even... I don't know how to say anything intelligent about it. It's, it's <laughs> not. For you, it just doesn't make not. sense. I'm sorry? I said, for you, it just doesn't make sense. You can't make sense of it. Anyone who reads, I mean, it cannot make sense. There's no one who could look at the evidence and who just has spent some time. Because I wanted to understand. Because I said, maybe I'm missing something. And I really do. My job is to look at all sides of an issue. Anyone who reads anything, and, and, and they, they cannot believe that the election was stolen, rightfully. They cannot believe that. So th these people, um, one by one, Dr. Brown, they're turning themselves in. Uh, Trump is expected uh, on, on Thursday. As they turn themselves in, pe more and more people are looking at this indictment. When you read this indictment, it tells a very, very big, large picture as to what happened, not just with Trump, but for everyone. It tells a story. You have to go get your coffee in order to sit down to take this in. I want to ask you, what are your thoughts about the, the indictment, the, the way that it was written, and the fact that all of these people are going to be tried in concert, not an easy task, but had to be done according to Fannie Williams because she wanted everybody to see the whole racketeering picture? Yes, I think she's done a, a good job of kind of um, building these cases. Uh, but just to kind of step back for a minute, I feel like that any claims at this point that the 2020 election was stolen, um, to me, sounds just flat out ridiculous. Um, the election has been extensively investigated, and multiple courts, including the Supreme Court, has dismissed what? claims of, of widespread uh, voter fraud. Um, but in addition to being necessary for justice, these indictments, they also hold a symbolic significance. Um, they force us to confront the reality that those who... Uh, fell for the circus show and the baseless, baseless uh, claims and conspiracy theories surrounding the 2020 election were extremely misguided. That um, those individuals that placed their trust into um, these 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 folks were these folks were spreading spreading falsehoods and and potentially misguiding them. Not potentially, they were misguiding them deliberately. And so I think that that raises questions about sort of where we are and how this misinformation can can extremely manipulate an entire sort of culture within America. And so, yes, um, it did have to be a sort of methodical approach to these indictments. And I can kind of say that's what seems to be going on. I want to stick with you for a quick answer. Do you think that, like Eastman, Trump will also say, I still think that this election was stolen? What are your thoughts about that? I'll stick with you, Dr. Brown. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, like, like I said before, right, what I think is is, is somewhat uh, necessarily irrelevant, we can look at the facts. And the fact is that he rolls with a policy or philosophy to never admit anything of guilt, never admit that he was wrong in anything. And so because of that, he will continue to do that. That's just who he is. It's the history um, of his rhetoric. And so uh, regardless of what anybody thinks, we can look at the facts that that is what's probably going to happen. Jesse, certainly everyone's learning about this whole idea of racketeering and not just in the context of mobsters. If we recall, racketeering was also used when it came to R. Kelly and he's sitting behind bars. So this is something that Fani has used many times before with great success.
What do you think about the success in this particular case and where this racketeering charge could possibly go? Well, first off, this is the Georgia statute for racketeering, which is much broader than the federal statute. Uh, on top of that, you know, we, we do have, you know, audio evidence of Trump encouraging uh, election officials uh, to go back and find him votes. So uh, I, I think I don't want to say that anything is open and shut, particularly as it relates to Trump. Uh, but I think that if there were an open and shut case to be made, uh, this is certainly one that would do that. Um, I also want to caution people. I think that we are approaching a very slippery slope. The reason why uh, Trump and his cohort continue to say that this election was rigged and all those things is because they are attempting to insult the American intelligence. Uh, they don't want you reading the indictment. The indictment is about 98 pages long. Um, and if you read it, it lays out clearly exactly what uh, Fonnie Willis thinks has happened. Um, it, they want you to believe that facts don't matter. They want you to believe that the only thing that matters is what you are told. And for a lot of people who may have some concerns about the direction that the country is in or what the country is starting to look like, uh, they cling to it. And what I'm really concerned about is we've seen time and again the uh, system not necessarily work out the way it's supposed to. We're dealing with a president that encouraged people to overthrow the government, um, and yet uh, he's, he's still walking around free, even running for president again. Mm. So um, I, I think we have to be very cognizant about the system and the way that we it, that it's supposed to work. Uh, but we also have to be cognizant to read things and not just listen to speak about it. Uh, Randy, he rallied his base. He put forth potentially in this indictment. It was a part of a scheme, Trump, of putting together fake electors for seven states. He asked Vice President Pence, let's give it a go. He asked people to, you know, for votes. Well, we need to find some votes. He tried, according to this indictment, many, many things in order to make this a victory for him. What is your take on how you think a jury might receive all of this evidence that they need to sort through? Well, just as my brother said, um, you would think that, it, it, because if you do read the indictment, it is so clearly laid out to really paint a clear picture of this entire scam. But what we've seen, because, you know, Trump was brilliant in that he really rigged the system and, and who he put in place um, as far as judges, who he put in place um, and just throughout the court system. So I, I'm very concerned about what a jury will will see. Um, if this were, if I were watching a television show or something, I would say, oh, that we know how this is going to end. Mm -hmm. But this is like some sci-fi stuff that we're in now <laughs> that I, you know, that, you know, that I can't predict. This is not even a drama anymore. This is this is some fantasy sci-fi, you know, things that's happening. And so I, I really don't, I don't know. I, I never, I, I've gotten with Trump's in his presidency and, you know, since he came to be in office, I really am not surprised by anything anymore because I was so consistently disappointed just to maintain my own mental health. I always have to leave it that anything is possible. Um, but I, I, I mean, the sister did such a beautiful job of mm. outlining how, you know, it, it, that someone like me who does not have a law degree can understand it if they would take the time to read it. And so it should be just open and shut. There's so many examples of what he did, like you stated, that I just don't see how he cannot be found guilty. But again, we're in a, in a sci-fi movie. And you make a very good point in that if you read this indictment, you read Jack Smith's indictment, they don't write it in the regular legal legalese that we are, are kind of accustomed to. They tell a story so that everybody can really understand what certainly is important, especially uh, when we're talking about debates coming up and we're talking about the election coming up. These debates, I think, will prove to be very, very interesting. Trump will not be there, Dr. Brown. But what are your thoughts about how this indictment and what Trump is going through, even though he's not on the stage during these debates that are coming up, what, how do you think that will play into this or, or at all? Of course, he is going to be with someone else, a, an unnamed Fox host, um, so he will have his, his, his day. But how do you think all of that will intersect during the debates? Certainly, the, well, while he won't be there in person, his presence will certainly be felt. 
um, people they will be talking about Trump, right? He is the front runner runner um, for for the GOP. When it comes to um, you know these these indictments and things like that, I think that Trump is really using a lot of this to bolster himself and his his uh, his, his followers, right? His constituency, and and that this allows them to push that narrative that everyone is against us, that our backs are against the wall. That is, you know, we need to rally ourselves and and fight for our our our, our lives as we know it as as Americans and our in our identity. So he's really using this, and I think that the reason why um, um, the, the indictment was written the way that it was is to sort of combat some of that, to make sure that Trump isn't the only one that's talking in somewhat, you know, um, I would say regular layman terms, I guess, and non legal terms. He's not the only one doing that. That. The way with this is written can also be posted on social media for everyone to understand and to um, interpret. And so I think it's a good move in that case. Uh, I do think that Trump is going to continue to say the same things that he's been saying and use this to help uh, help his own cause and his own case for his base. And we've seen that his base is sufficient enough or has been. Oh, yeah. His base, he can rally up very easily, especially with all these indictments, using it as really a part of his campaign strategy. Jesse, you have seen lawsuits come and go. I I'm wondering, is there a point that you think that ultimately Trump may fail in his efforts to use the legal system, the lawsuits, the indictments? And we're not just talking about these four lawsuits. We're talking about other lawsuits outside of these four indictments that we've heard about. Do you think that all of these, uh, the, the legal process will always play in his favor? Or do you think he will reach a breaking point? Ooh, well, that's that's an interesting question, because I would have thought it, he, we would have reached a breaking point before we got <laughs> right, here. Right, right. Uh, so what I'll say is, you know, some good points have already been brought up about uh, look at who he's appointed for federal positions. But this is state court. <clears throat> And in state court, uh, until he, you know, I'm sure he's going to file a motion to try to remove it to federal. But in state court, I think he has much less of an opportunity. Now, I want to be clear, because there's also been some reports about people within his group who have published addresses of the grand jury members who indicted him. Uh, there are very nefarious tactics that have been used to try to deter or dissuade. Uh, and somebody's got to be a jury for the case. Mm -hmm. So... You know, people are going to be nervous about putting their information up or, or even participating in the process, which may play a factor. But I think, you know, one of the things that always stands out to me is the way that he has already been able to circumnavigate certain things that the regular person wouldn't be able to do. Like, for instance, they have a report date mm -hmm. for criminal charges, for felonies. <laughs> they have a report date. Anybody else just gets picked up. There's, right. there's no warning. Um, so, and he, he obviously already has his people galvanized for the $200,000 bond that he's going to have to pay. So the process is going to look a little different, but ultimately he still has to have his day in court. It's going to be with a state judge who's not necessarily impacted by any of the federal policies that he has, uh, has implemented. And we shall see. That's right. We shall see. Um, listen, as you said, a little special treatment there, something that Trump would say, that's actually par for the course. I should get this special treatment. But TikTok for Trump waiting for Thursday. If he does have till Friday, certainly Roland Martin Unfiltered will be on the case. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back after these messages. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage 
as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. On the next to balance life with me, Dr. Jackie. Summer is flying by and back to school is just around the corner and fall is here. That's right, a new season is upon us. On our next show, we talk about jumping into action and putting procrastination in the rearview mirror. That's on a next a balanced life with Dr. Jackie here on Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Next, on The Black Table, with me, Greg Carr. The United States is the most dangerous place for a woman to give birth among all industrialized nations on the planet. Think about that for a second. That's not all. Black women are three times more likely to die in this country during childbirth than white women. These healthcare systems are inherently racist. Um, there are a lot of white supremacist ideas and mythologies around black women, black women's bodies, even black people that we experience pain less, right? Activist, organizer, and fearless freedom fighter Monifa Akinwole Bandele from Moms Rising joins us and tells us this shocking phenomenon, like so much else, is rooted in unadulterated racism. And that's just one of her fights. Monifa Bandele on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Hello, we're the Critter Fixers. I'm Dr. Bernard Hodges. And I'm Dr. Terrence Ferguson. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin Unfiltered. One month before student loan payments resume, enrollment for President Joe Biden's new student loan repayment plan begins. Biden says this is the most affordable student loan plan ever. You know, I'm a firm believer in education beyond high school, and that should be a ticket to the middle class, not a burden that weighs people down for decades to come trying to pay their debt. On day one of my administration, I promised to fix the problems in the existing student loan program that hurt borrowers for much too long. And I'm proud we're keeping that promise. We've already approved over $116 billion in debt cancellation for 3.4 million Americans, no matter how many lawsuits, challenges, or roadblocks Republican elected officials or special interests try to put in our way. And today, I'm proud to announce a new program called the SAVE Plan. It's the most affordable student loan plan ever. And here's how it works. To pay back that loan, you had to pay 10% of your discretionary income. That's all the income available to you after you pay for food, housing, and all your basic needs. Under my new plan, reducing that payment to just 5% of your disposable income. That's going to save the typical borrower around $1,000 a year. It's going to give borrowers a little bit more breathing room. And if your annual income is less than $30,000, your monthly payment will be zero until it gets above $30,000. As long as you pay what you owe under this plan, you'll no longer see your loan balance grow because of unpaid interest. Under the SAVE plan, monthly payments are based on your income not your student loan balance. And here's how you can enroll in the SAVE program. Visit studentaid.gov save and submit an application. It takes about 10 minutes to fill it out. And if you're eligible for the SAVE plan, sign up now so you can lower your monthly payments in advance of payments resuming this fall. I've said it before and I'll say it again. As long as I'm president, my administration will never stop fighting to deliver relief to borrowers and bring the promise of college to more Americans. And that's a commitment. 
All right, so here's how it goes, pay attention. Undergraduate borrowers' payments will be reduced from 10% of their discretionary income to 5%. And people with both graduate and undergraduate loans will pay a weighted average somewhere between 5% and 10% of their income, depending upon the original principal balances. The plan will also work to eliminate remaining interest. That's good news for a lot of people, meaning that as long as you make your monthly payment, your loan balance won't grow as a result of unpaid interest. Student loan payments have been paused since March 2020, but interest is set to begin accruing again on September 1st, and payments will start again in October. Now, to find out if you're eligible for the SAVE plan, go to studentaid.gov website. Now, listen, this has been a long time coming. This is something we heard on the campaign trail of Joe Biden. And for years, he worked on this, ultimately went to the Supreme Court, his original plan. And now he is here with the SAFE plan. You have millions of people who were already in limbo before they had applied for his original plan. And then they were told that plan is no longer because of the decision by the Supreme Court. Do you have any faith in this particular plan Randy, because it, it seems as though a lot of people have been waiting with bated breath and thought that they were, you know, going to get in, and then all of a sudden their 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 dreams were smashed. I do. I do have faith in this plan. I don't believe that he would move it forward if he didn't have great confidence that it could continue to be, because of the fact that already he's had something that he put out there that, you know, did not pass, that that failed. So I do believe. I feel hopeful about this plan, and I'm happy to see it. I mean, this plan affects, you know, Black people more than anybody. I mean, we have at least $25,000 more in debt, um, the average Black person and the average uh, white person, when it comes to student debt. So it's really important in our community and affects our financial health. So I do hope it pushes through, and I feel hopeful that it will. Dr. Brown, do you know people, I'm sure, who are affected by this and are kind of waiting for this to happen so that they can actually have some type of relief. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts here in terms of the numbers and where you might fall in, but it seems that the, as though if this plan is carried out, some people, well, actually millions, will get some relief. Yeah, I can almost almost guarantee that we all know people that are going to be affected by this, um, but man, oh man, has <laughs> this thing been a mess. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> kudos to, to, to Biden and his, his administration for doing what they could right now to help those that are just drowning in student debt. Um, you know, I, I hope that additional student loan forgiveness programs are implemented soon, um, because, I mean, we could all use some relief from the financial burden of higher education. Um, but, you know, as was said, Black people in general, Black students, are disproportionately affected by things like this. Um, even once they graduate and enter into the workforce, uh, they're more likely to experience unemployment, underemployment, underemployment um, which makes paying off their loans even tougher. So, well, this new repayment plan is a step in the right direction. Uh, we have to keep in mind and make sure we do keep in mind that it's important to acknowledge and address the systemic inequalities that put Black people at a disadvantage before, during, and after college, and hopefully someday we can even get to a place in this world where education is fully accessible for everyone, regardless of race or social economic status. Absolutely, because these days when you go get a job, well, they are asking for those college degrees, and people are working to get graduate degrees in order to increase um, their salaries. I think what's interesting, Jesse, is that studies have shown that many, many people, I think it's about 40 percent, they actually have these loans and didn't finish school. So they cannot take advantage of their completed academic journey to get those higher salaries. They're just paying off this loan, perhaps with lower salaries. Um, and I think that that had a lot to do uh, with kind of the decisions that have been out there. What are your thoughts about this plan um, and, and the hope that I'm sure millions of people across the country are having today? Well, first, I always like to give credit where credit is due. Um, when the Supreme Court ruling came out about his original uh, student loan plan, uh, the, the, the decision is very awkward, uh, and, and there, the uh, group bringing the action, uh, there's questions about whether or not they even had standing to do that, uh, but the Supreme Court has decided the way they did. So President Biden could have easily folded it all up and said, okay, well, I'm not going to work on student loan reform at all anymore. But that's not what he did. What he did was say, I'm going to honor the commitment that I made to the American people, and I'm going to present another plan. 
So whenever you see these plans presented, what you always want to look at is in the first couple months of the rollout, who challenges the plan, mm. right? Um, and so right now, uh, it sounds great. Anytime that you're reducing the amount of discretionary income from 10% to 5% uh, as far as loan repayment goes, you're giving people a little extra money in their pocket. But just because he puts a plan out there, as we've seen before, doesn't necessarily mean that people in Congress will support it, doesn't necessarily mean that there's not some agency gathering up folks to oppose it and to file uh, court action to stop it. And I want everybody to understand that there are certainly people who capitalize off of you being in debt, right? That's so, right. So they are going to work very hard to make sure. Also, there are people who know everything that we discussed earlier about the groups who are benefiting primarily in entering the middle class through education. In a perfect world, education would be free, but in America, education is a commodity and not necessarily a right extended to all. And so as long as it's commoditized, there's always going to be a price tag to it. And it's also always going to be used as a gatekeeping function to prevent or avoid so many people getting through the door. Now, interestingly enough, this has become a partisan issue. Uh, Republicans calling it a scheme, Republicans calling it despicable. People saying, what about me? I paid off my loans. I should be benefiting from this. I can kind of understand that one myself. Uh, when, uh, when we talk about this, Randy, we are talking about more money, hopefully, that is being put into the economy, ultimately, because there are people who pay in the four digits a month. They are paying a mortgage on their loans because they cannot um, and, but they cannot make those payments. Uh, I, I just wanted to talk to you about the economy and what this could potentially do to the economy, because this has been one of the points uh, that, that Biden and, and Vice President Harris have been making. Right. If any time you can give people more income, more disposable income, you're going to help the economy. Um, when you reduce the debt and what their monthly payments are, we Americans like to spend, and we <laughs> will spend it outside. And so this this could be great for the economy. I just wanted to say one thing. When we talk about this debt and how schools should be accessible to everybody, let's just not forget that colleges at one point, several were free. Mm. And when, 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 like in California, but when minorities started going, all of a sudden they wanted to charge money, right? And so it has always been used, um, this charging people money, colleges, creating debt in certain communities has always been a way to block access for us um, for years. And so this is just a continuance of that. And so I do like the fact that Biden was dedicated to making this change. And it will help overall. It will help people personally, but on a, on a, on a, um, on a country's level, it should strengthen the, the economy. All right, everything from CRT, affirmative action, loans, when it comes to education, it really has been on the chopping block, and it's certainly something that we'll be paying attention to in the future as these stories unfold. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, and we'll be right back after break. You go into a barber shop in a, in a, in a 700 credit score neighborhood, black or white, they're talking about their ideas and, and they're talking about how they're going to move on those things. You go to a barber shop at a 500 credit score, equal brilliance but bad culture, they're talking about other people. You go to a winner's, winner's barber shop, here's what I'm doing. You go to the barber shop of the where people feel defeated, they talk about other people, either celebrities or, 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 or people they admire, but also often, I don't like Joe. I don't like, you know, I don't like Roland Martin. Well, let me tell you something. I don't understand people. Why, how could you not like anything here you see? You should just be like, this is amazing. It's cool. You may not even like how he does it or how I do it, but it's like, you know what? They're succeeding. They're killing it. All you should be is, that's fantastic. But if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about mm -hmm. me, it's hard for me to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's the big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life right. a living hell. Up next on The Frequency with me, Dee Barnes, the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion and the subsequent trial of Tory Lane. 
Megan has been treated like the villain. The experience that Megan went through is something that all Black women face when we are affected by violence. This is something that's called massage noir. There's a long history of characterizing Black women as inherently bad in order to um, justify our place in the society. Next on The Frequency with me, D Barnes. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on The Proud Family. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. Hi, I'm Joe Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder, Disney Plus. And I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. <laughs> Brandon George has been missing from Camden, Delaware since June 16, 2023. The 13-year-old is 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighs 160 pounds with black hair, brown eyes, and a scar on his forehead. Anyone with information about Brandon George should call the Dover, Delaware Police Department at 302-736-7111. In Texas, a federal judge rules against certain provisions of election laws passed two years ago as the Republican Party sought to tighten voting rules after former President Donald Trump's loss. U.S. District Judge Xavier Rodriguez struck the law that required mail voters to provide the same identification number they use when they register to vote. He ruled the requirement violates the U.S. Civil Rights Act because it led to people being unable to cast ballots because of something unrelated to whether or not they were registered. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark says the ruling sends a clear message that states cannot impose unlawful and unnecessary requirements that disenfranchise eligible voters. A New York jury convicts a white man for trying to kill a Black Lives Matter protesters in 2020. On Monday, Frank Cavaluzzi was found guilty of nine counts of attempted murder and other charges after a two-week trial for threatening peaceful demonstrators on June 2, 2020, during a wave of protests over the murder of George Floyd. Now, Cavaluzzi, he threatened protesters wearing a glove with serrated blades and then got into his SUV and tried to run them over. He faces up to 25 years to life in prison for each of the attempted murder charges and will be sentenced in October. On Monday, a Georgia sheriff pleaded guilty to groping TV judge Glenda Hatchett. Uh, Blakely County Sheriff Christopher Cody pleaded guilty in Cobb County State Court to a misdemeanor of a charge of sexual battery. He was sentenced to a year of probation. He also resigned from being a sheriff, a position that he'd held since 2017. Judge Hatchett says she was so stunned when it happened that she froze when the man grabbed and squeezed her breast last year at a hotel during a law enforcement conference. All right, Roland Martin will be right back, right here on the Black Star Network. Blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Devon Franklin. It is always a pleasure to be in the house. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here.
All right, I want to bring the panel in to talk about some of the headlines that we were talking about. I want to first talk about that federal judge uh, who ruled that provisions of election laws passed two years ago um, to, so to tighten the voting rules after former uh, President um, Donald Trump's loss. I wanted to go to the panel and start with you first, Randy, and, and talk about the ruling and how Kristen Clark said it herself that this was a message that states really cannot impose unlawful and unnecessary requirements that disenfranchise voters. Seems like a win, not a lot of win when it comes to voter for, uh, suppression overall when we were hearing the headlines, but this is something that is in favor uh, of the voters that are often disenfranchised. And that was for Randy. We really need to pay attention to all of the laws that are, you know, coming up and the cases that are going up in these counties because, you know, after I always tell people, and I think it's important to note, we would win every election if we turn out. If black people show up for election, we very much have the power to decide how an election goes. The problem is, it's really all of, and I can't call it anything else but cheating, all that goes on prior to an election to make it difficult for our people to vote. So it may seem something that's small, but when they're trying to restrict the hours that we are able to vote or restrict someone bringing someone food and water, knowing that they may have to work uh, or stand in line for four or five hours, or create laws that are so um, just arbitrary, like you must have your voter registration number and it must match, you know, the numbers must match. Like, who who keeps up with that information? It's hard enough just to keep up with our social security numbers, <laughs> but they want us to have, you know, so all of these little um, requirements they're putting on to make it where they can throw out a lot of votes, where they already did, right, to make it where the votes don't count. So they can find any little thing to say, you know what, that vote is not valid, we get to throw it out. And so it's, I'm so relieved to see that people are paying attention and that people are challenging these laws that are absolutely bogus and really are designed to get away of, of, of our democratic system. A little bit of progress, would you say, Jesse, when we look at this particular law, because there are just dozens of states across the country that have passed laws that have, uh, that are suppressing voters, um, and they're doing so quietly and not so quietly, but the numbers are up there. What are your thoughts about this little win? Well, it's always good to see that the Voting Rights Act still matters, right? Um, there's, there's been so much done to carve out every exception, uh, largely based and premised on this concept of voter fraud that we still haven't yet seen. Um, but, but that talking point is out in the atmosphere. And for so long and for so many people, uh, there's just not been a way to challenge it. Um, this is nothing but, like, modern-day poll taxing. And I think about, more so in this case, how much it took to get this, this uh, group of people to fight a case at the federal level, because that's the other thing. Even if your voting rights are violated, somebody has to have the resources to bring the case. So how many people didn't have the resources and how many people in other jurisdictions aren't getting in front of a court to be able to challenge it? On top of that, voting for a lot of people is one of those things where if they can do it, they will, but if you create enough hazards uh, to prevent people from being able to access the ballot, they will give up and essentially concede their vote to someone else who is willing or probably doesn't have those same impediments. Mm -hmm. So this, I think this ruling is a step in the right direction, but I think there's a lot more that we need to do to protect that right. You know, Dr. Brown, I wanted to move on to another topic that we that I discussed in the headlines that has to do with this, uh, the jury, a New York jury that convicted a white man for trying to kill a Black Lives Matter um, protester in 2020. And, you know, I think that this is a, a very interesting case because of the fact that this was a man that was using serrated blades, then got in his car to drive through and, and run over these people. New York, the New York jury decided that he is going to jail. And I think this is important to bring up because of the fact that people all over the country who are protesting for so many things, this sets a good precedent, Jesse, I'm sorry, Dr. Brown, for, for what is to come for other cases that are coming up on dockets across the country. Most definitely. I mean, I think that this indictment, um, it highlights some, some deeply troubling patterns where black resistance and activism 
is met with punishment and further resistance to their resistance. Um, it's disheartening to, to witness continuous targeting and harassment of uh, protesters like Black Lives Matter, um, activists who are peacefully at times uh, advocating for racial justice. And so this, uh, you know, this conviction uh, of this wannabe Wolverine uh, attempting to sort of <laughs> harass and, 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 and cause harm um, to these activists, um, I think it, it sheds light on um, some of the things within our society that when black individuals assert their right and demand for equality, they're met with backlash, violence, um, and often from criminals themselves. And these, these patterns are not isolated, right? They're not new. Um, we've seen this thing throughout history uh, where we've seen countless examples of black individuals facing, you know, um, attack or violation, or sorry, uh, violence for daring to challenge the status, the status quo, right? Yes. Or, uh, you know, from the civil rights movement to present day protests, uh, we see that black resistance has been met with harsh consequences, whether it be from police brutality or whether it be from uh, um, citizens uh, that, uh, that are using their creativity to form weapons. All right, wannabe Wolverine, I like that. We're gonna use, listen, he earned that, Frank Cavaluzzi, he earned that with his serrated knives on his hand. All right, we are going to leave it there and more Roland Martin Unfiltered when we come back after a break. Stay with us. Next, on The Black Table, with me, Greg Carr. The United States is the most dangerous place for a woman to give birth among all industrialized nations on the planet. Think about that for a second. That's not all. Black women are three times more likely to die in this country during childbirth than white women. These healthcare systems are inherently racist. Um, there are a lot of white supremacist ideas and mythologies around black women, black women's bodies, even black people that we experience pain less, right? Activist, organizer, and fearless freedom fighter Monifa Akinwole Bandele from Moms Rising joins us and tells us this shocking phenomenon, like so much else, is rooted in unadulterated racism. And that's just one of her fights. Monifa Bandele on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, have you ever had that million dollar idea and wondered how you could make it a reality? On the next Get Wealthy, you're going to meet Liska Askelis, the inventress, someone who made her own idea a reality and now is showing others how they can do it too. Positive, focusing in on the thing that you want to do, writing it down, and not speaking to naysayers or anybody about your product until you've taken some steps to at least execute. Lisa Askelis on the next Get Wealthy, right here, only on Black Star Network. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. According to the World Resources Institute's Aqueduct Water Risk Atlas, a quarter of the world's population faces an extremely high water stress each year. An additional one billion people are expected to be affected by the year 2050. Extremely high water stress means countries use almost all of their water. Well, retired Captain Moses A. West is founder of the Moses West Foundation. He developed technology that pulls water from the atmosphere. Moses joins me from Chicago to explain atmospheric water generation. Moses, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. You look like hey, you got a perfect setting. We're talking about water. You in front some water. Tell me a little bit about this creation that really has just some stunning um, uh, attributes to it because people, you know, don't realize if we remember back, water comes in three forms, right? Liquid, solid, gas, and you are taking that and you are actually creating water. How exactly are you doing that? 
Oh, uh, thank you for having me on the show to start with. Uh, yeah, and, and also, I, I also like walking and talking, so this is really good for me. I just finished doing a radio show. Hey, um, the, uh, the water in its gaseous state that we have it in the atmosphere, it's the most plentiful state. Like, here I am right now uh, next to this waterfall in Chicago, this fountain. Mm -hmm. And Lake Michigan, it's, the air is very humid. It's going to be... Um, it's going to be 109, 110 degrees tomorrow at, um, at O'Hare in Midway uh, Airport. So that's going to mean that there's a lot of water that's going to be in the atmosphere. And so what I've done is I've created a technology that allows you to pull that moisture, to condense that moisture out of the air the same way that you take a glass in the middle of the summertime and you put that uh, cold glass, that cold bottle of Coke on the table, you've all done it, and that, and that bottle of Coke just continues to sweat, right? Yes. Well, with that picture that you see of the machine right there pushing that water out, that machine does that using, a mechan using mechanical techniques that I've created over the years to efficiently pull that moisture out of the air uh, uh, with a lower energy consumption than you can use, than is needed to pull it out of the ground. So basically, that box that you see in that picture, you can sit it right here, and everybody in this park in uh, Chicago could drink from, from that water for the next forever. Now, this box that we are looking at, it's solar powered, I would imagine. Absolutely, it's solar powered. But also, what I did was I. Uh, the big box that you see, I put on there a, uh, a generator. So it's got its own internal generator in case you don't have solar power. So basically, you could take that box anywhere. You could drop it where you need it in the world, and you could turn it on, and you could produce water. And we're, we've already done that. We did it in Flint, Michigan, and we did it on the island of Vieques in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And, that and box that you see, go on. Yes, yes, the box that we see. Yeah, that box has uh, supplied the 4th Ward in Flint, Michigan. I built two of those. One supplied the 4th Ward with all their drinking water. We allowed people who were homeless, who couldn't clean their houses, to move back to their homes because we could give them one, two, three hundred gallons of water a day that they needed, and then the machine would make water again. And then on the island of Vieques, we uh, ran it on solar power, and we produced enough water for 15,000 people to drink without the need of FEMA having to ship water in to Vieques. And we did that on solar power. And that's very important. You talked about uh, FEMA, and, and when we talk about the federal government getting involved, you are really providing a, a huge resource, resource, not just to places that have uh, been struck by some type of uh, uh, act of nature, but when we talk about Native Americans and their inability to have access to water, there are people who have never really drunk their water from their faucets. They have lived for decades on bottled water. You are coming into places like that, and you are making water accessible. And I think it's something that people take for granted, the water that we drink all day or the half a bottle of waters that we throw away. People around the world do not have it. Talk to me about what you did in Puerto Rico, for example, that allowed the community to just do better and be better because of the machine that you created. Well, in Puerto Rico, when I, when I got to Puerto Rico, their water system was already contaminated, the water that's on the island. Uh, they have to chlorinate it truly heavily to get it to be drinkable. I met some people, just a couple stores. I met a guy who was drinking water from a pipe that ran underneath the cemetery. He was so desperate, wow. he drank the water on the other side. He got some kind of an intestinal problem, uh, gastrointestinal problem. They had to cut him open to just to let it, just to let it fester out of his body. I met uh, Tahino Indians, Native Americans, that uh, uh, were bleeding from their eyes, from their gums. Uh, swollen stomachs, and when we started to produce the water on the island, I had to explain to everybody that this water was already there because it was in the, the moisture and the humidity in the air that was around them. And so in Puerto Rico, we set the machine up, and basically, liquid, solid, and gas is the only three ways the water comes, and we produced water for the entire island after Hurricane Maria. So the people there accepted the technology, but I had to explain to them that 
where it was coming from because nobody believed me that it was pulling out of the air. Right, right. And you know, it's a concept that I think people understand. Um, listen, I know as a black woman, we understand that there is moisture in the air and we yes. protect our hairstyles. <laughs> and trust me, we get that. We know when that moisture, you go down to New Orleans, you are, have a different hair plan than you do when you're maybe up in New Jersey or Miami. But the bottom uh, line is that you are correct. It affects and, and it, you can pull water from the air. How much water does this machine process, let's say over, over a day or over an hour? How do you break down the gallons that it processes and how fast? 1,250 gallons of water a day. That's 5,000 liters. Wow, wow. And as, and as long as I'm pulling the water out of the air and people are taking it, the machine continues to fill up as you, as you empty it. If I pull out 200 gallons of water, <laughs> you sit there long enough, it'll make that 200 gallons back. So wow. when you're removing water, it's continuously refilling the machine. Along this endless supply. Yes, yes. Along this process, you are also eliminating food deserts. Tell me how you're uh, doing that. Well, uh, say like say like here in a place like this in Chicago. Say you have this this tree line over here. Okay, that tree line over there. Say if you're you're not producing any water here, we have all the water in the air. Well, if I pull the water out of the air using sunlight to produce the water, then that pure water is used to grow food. That is 100% sustainable. So you're pulling the water from the air, using solar power to grow food. If you built that closed off over there, all you'd have to do is come back and just grow, pick up the food. It's that simple. Wow. Greenhouse, water generator, solar panels, food. You don't even have to touch it. Just put little cameras in there and let all the kids around the United States see the plants grow. And, and this water that's generated, does it have to be processed in any way once it's gathered or you take it as is? in terms of just the, what, what is the process that it goes through in order to make it usable if there is one? Oh, the, when the machine is, when, when the machine is, is, when I deploy a machine and it's fresh, it's brand new, it's clean, all the filters are clean, I can drain the water directly off the coil. But go, going by federal guidelines, as you can see, everything is green. Everything is green because I make equipment for the military. So the military has the technology in use. So uh, it goes just through basic carbon filtration. And then you can control the pH of the water by how much carbon filtration you add or subtract. You can add ozone emitters, to, uh, ozone transmitters to the, to the water system. You can add chlorinators. You can tailor the water to what you would like to have it. Uh, because what you're doing is you're taking water from its pure source as you make it. So you can do with it what you want. You know, I think we really have to acknowledge just the fact that you came up with this. What, what is your background, and when did this come to you, that this was something that you should take on, and then how did you actually carry out this idea from beginning to what we're seeing on the screen right now? Well, it, it started out as, uh, as a kid, uh, growing up in Texas, we had a, we called it the land of a thousand springs. So when I was a little kid, we could actually pick up uh, we could actually drink water as it came out of the ground. We could jump into creeks and we could swim. We could go fishing. So that's what, that's what I grew up with. And then in the military, I was stationed in places where we wouldn't get supplied with water sometimes. And then once in Saudi Arabia, it was so hot that I was like, if, I don't get a, if we don't get a water supply, I'm going to jump in this helicopter and I'm going to fly someplace where there is some water mm. because we're not going to survive. It was 150 degrees. Wow. And then I lived in Australia for 11 years. In Australia, they have a thing called toilet to tap. I got back one year to, uh, uh, I came, I was always coming back and forth to the States. And then I got to uh, Australia one time and we were drinking water from the, uh, uh, we were drinking water that just had filtered and turned around from the toilet back to the tap. And then I saw the, uh, what the drought had done to the country. I saw acres and acres of dead trees because the salt water had creeped back into the ground uh, from the ocean because they pulled up so much fresh water. And seeing all these things, all these different situations around the world uh, with, the, with the degradation of pure water, the degradation of our groundwater, and knowing that the atmosphere was full of water because we're always living in this humidity, I decided that, you know, I saw this little machine in Hawaii, and I said, if it, someone can make a little machine, mm. 
I could definitely make a big one. And, and that, that you did. Um, listen, Moses, you're going to stay with us after we come back from the break, and you're going to continue to teach us about water and liquids and solids and gases. And we're going to talk to our panel. We'll have some questions for you. How amazing is this? You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, and we'll be right back after a break with more Moses. Blackness and what happens in black culture. We are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Up next on the frequency with me, D Barnes, the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion and the subsequent trial of Tory Lane. Megan has been treated like the villain. The experience that Megan went through is something that all black women face when we are affected by violence. This is something that's called massage noir. There's a long history of characterizing black women as inherently bad in order to um, justify our place in the society. Next on The Frequency with me, D Barnes. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman. Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, but well, we are still here. We are talking with Moses West, and he is talking to us about actually getting water from the air. I want to go to our panel. I'm sure that they're as intrigued as I am. Let me start with you, Randy. What question do you have for really this professor of water, if you will? I just first have to express how much in awe I am of you, Mr. West. This is incredible what you've created. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that my grandchildren will be reading about you in science class when we talk about inventors one day. Um, so thank you for your contribution. To this, to this entire world. So how do you connect with communities? Um, this water shortage is already evidencing itself in many areas. You mentioned Flint, Michigan. I think about what recently just happened in Jackson, Mississippi. How do communities get in touch with you um, to get your have the solution available to them? Well, I started out, when I first started out doing this, uh, as is anything in the United States when you have a really good idea, people are sometimes here in this country are, are going to try to take what you have. And uh, I've, I've went through that. But what I've always tried to do is I've always tried to connect with just making sure that the, the average man and woman on the street understands what this technology is and how it works. And so that, that groundswell of grassroots connections that I've made over the past 10 years has, has risen up and gotten to the, you know, the highest levels to get you with, to NBC, ABC, and CBS, and, uh, and CNN, and the, and the Washington Post, just by doing humanitarian work. So uh, mainly that's how, and through my foundation, the Moses West Foundation, uh, that's, uh, donations came through there, got me to Puerto Rico, got me to Flint, got me to Jackson, Mississippi, and helps me to educate people about this technology. Dr. Brown, question for Moses. Yeah, M Moses, I, I, you know, I want to say how incredible this is. I think that, you know, your name is Moses like the Bible, but it's more mm -hmm. like a modern day Noah as an engineer, um, except for instead of an ark, you built a, a machine that creates water to, out of thin air. Um, I think that's incredible. I mean, my, my, my question is, when is your next invention going to turn that water into wine? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can already do that. <laughs> You could already make alcohol with it. Nice, love it. <laughs> He's a step ahead of you. 
<laughs> there you go. Well, all, all jokes aside, I think that, um, you know, you and your generator are important for, you know, for black people specifically because of the positive impact that, um, that you've had uh, in your technology. Uh, you know, looking at places that you affected like Flint and like Jackson, uh, Mississippi, this is huge. My question is, I'm sure when you first started to create this, right, seeing the small version um, and having the, the creativity and sort of the imagination to make a large version of this type of technology, I'm sure you had some people that were very skeptical. Can you talk about some of that uh, skepticism that people might have had <laughs> as you the process? I've had some PhDs come up to me and say, hey, if you run this machine, you're going to take, it's going to change the entire environment of the world. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> See, there is no way, no way mm -hmm. you could take all the humidity off of Lake Michigan, off of the Pacific Ocean, making trillions of gallons of water, considering from the surface to 10,000 feet, it is nothing, that's called the troposphere. And it's nothing but a water superhighway. And the hotter the planet gets, what happens? The more water evaporates. And water, guess what? H2O is a greenhouse gas. So the more, the hotter the planet gets, the more water that's in the atmosphere, the better these machines work. So that's one of the blowbacks that I got was people thinking that it was going to take too much water. The other blowback I got was people said, this machine wouldn't work. Mm. So if you look at every machine that I build, there's windows on the machines. Do you know why? So what? people can look inside that window uh -huh. and see the water being made because they said, some people said, oh, you just filled it up with water. Wow. <laughs> wow. Talk about the skeptics. Oh, wow. So, so I have to put windows on the machines, and the only thing the Marines asked me, told me to do, says, Moses, the next time you build machines for us, make bigger windows so we can have more Marines look at it at one time. Yeah, and that's, hey, listen, that's an exciting field trip for a lot of kids to see that water being made, I would imagine, too. Jesse, your question. Uh, Mr. West, I just wanted to say, first of all, you're a genius, and I'm sure you already know that. But if you haven't heard it already, I just wanted to make sure you know. Um, I'm curious, um, given the fact that there are so many corporate entities or whatnot who are involved in water, I'm, I'm curious as some of the blowback that you've gotten from some of the people who may not necessarily want you to bring what you're doing into the community, and how have you handled it, and what ways can we help you circumnavigate those situations? Uh, no blowback. The only blowback I've gotten is from uh, people trying to steal it from me, uh, former business partners, that kind of blowback. That's it. But so far, it's like um, uh, corporations, none at all. Uh, working closely with the United States military on the technology, if they, tell me that, if they tell me that there's something they want me to do in the way of the design of the machine, I can definitely do that. I can change that design up for them, uh, add to it, subtract to it, make it a different size, make it harder. So. Uh, with me and this technology so far, it's just been very positive because, one, I think no one thought I would ever succeed at it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. They thought I would just kind of be a, a flash in the pan and go away. And um, so I've been at it for 10 years, and here I am, and my biggest customer is the United States military. Moses, how long from the beginning? You said 10 years. Uh, now, now it's out there. But when did your first working product hit the market and what did it take to get venture capitalists to buy into your idea well the first venture capitalist that bought into my idea actually tried to take my company from me uh -huh. so, uh, so i stayed away from venture capital and i did it all on my with my with the profit from uh, what i made within my company and then i did things uh, philanthropically with the uh, moses west foundation strictly on donations from people uh, to get machine to get that machine to Puerto Rico and stay there. The, the, the only reason I had to come home from Puerto Rico is because the FEMA director told me, he said, Moses, you got to be alive to create more work. <laughs> because I was, I was working uh, mm. uh, every day, seven days a week, uh, 12, 15 hours a day. And so the, tech, uh, the technology so far, progressing it the way that I've done it, I've done it all on my own. But right now, I've got—I've uh, just now brought on a uh, managing director 
And uh, we're taking orders in right now for these large machines that you see right there mm -hmm. for 2024. We're building some right now. We're building a, a few for Peru. Wow. We're building two for, um, we're building two for uh, Maui to go to Hawaii for the situation that they just had there to make sure that the Native Americans can stay on their lands. And we're also working with the Native American Council here in the United States to uh, build some machines for uh, uh, the Native American homelands here as well. Moses, you mentioned Flint, Michigan earlier. You know, we don't see that in the headlines a lot. I'm sure that you're close to the pulse of things there. What, what is the situation there with their water, and where did you factor into that? Well, when we were in the fourth ward in Flint, Michigan, the, the people would donate water to Flint. And so when the water donations came in, people would announce where those were, and people would go show up to get the water. And there would be a line of cars a mile long. They would get a few cases of water. The water would run out. Then everybody would be left out. But after we were there long enough and people understood that we were never running out of water and they didn't have to take 20 or 30 gallons of water home with them, they, they said, well, can I just come here and get two or three gallons? Mm. I said, take as many gallon water jugs as you want. Every time you need water, just walk over here to the machine, fill it up. Let me show you how to do it. Take ownership of the machine. I'll be here to help you if you need it. So I sat there in my chair, and then sometimes the sister tour would sit there. Latoya Ruby Frazier came out, took pictures, and she did a whole uh, put it in the she put it in a book, uh, Flint in Three Acts. So Moses is actually the third act in her book, and then uh, so it was a it was an easy process to get the machine incorporated into the community by giving community, the community ownership of the technology. And so it was, uh, they, there was no need for water in the fourth ward. Wow, wow. Moses, Moses West, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today. And not only just telling us about what you've been doing, but really teaching us in the process, the same way that you taught those people in Flint, Michigan. You're not just history in the making, you have already made history. And I thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, good to see you too. Thank you. All right. I also want to thank our guests today, Randy Bryant, Dr. Drew Brown, Jesse Hamilton. Always good to speak with you, and it's always good to speak to the audience. Roland, we'll be back tomorrow. It was good being with you these couple of days, and we will see you next time here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Goodbye. Network is this. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network.